of the image of the serpent battling an eagle. This is especially popular in tattoos these days. Turns out there's no simple explanation. It basically represents a battle of good versus evil. A battle of the present versus the past. Or the difference between one belief system versus another. They are a combination of opposites. And somehow, they become the force that makes the universe turn. Now, the eagle is a large, powerful predator. Like all raptors, it has amazing eyesight, a hooked beak, designed to deliver a killing bite and rip flesh from bones. It has sharp talons that can pierce and hold prey. An eagle's wingspan is typically twice the length of its body, allowing it to soar easily. The eagle stands for admirable, intimidating power, which is why it appears in connection with so many political entities, second only to the sun, moon, and the stars, in its appearance on official flags and seals. It might be the black eagle, the golden eagle, or a bald eagle. It might have one head or two. In some cases, the two-headed eagle represents the combination of secular and religious power. Oy. The eagle is sometimes shown with a crown over its head, reinforcing its connection to royal power. In the same way, the eagle might be holding a royal scepter or an orb in its talons. It often has a shield or an emblem on its chest carrying the colors or symbols of the political party. The United States version, shown on everything from the official seal of the President of the United States to the dollar bill, features an eagle carrying a bundle of arrows in one foot, which is a symbol of military might, and an olive branch in the other, which is a symbol of peace. The Mexican flag carries the image of the golden eagle atop a cactus, grasping a snake. The very image the people had been promised would direct them to the place that they would make their new home. This is now the site of Mexico City. The serpent, snake, or dragon is a far more complicated part of the equation. Many people associate the serpent with evil because the Bible story where the snake offers Eve the fruit from the forbidden tree, you know, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the Genesis story of the fall of man, the serpent is described as more crafty than any of the other wild animals that the Lord had made. The serpent says to Eve, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? When she replies that God told them not to eat the fruit or even touch the tree in the center of the garden, for if they did, they would die. And the serpent replies, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, that was apparently the selling point for Eve. She takes the fruit, eats it, and gives some to her partner. It's very curious that the image and others portray the fruit as the Amanita muscaria, because their eyes were opened. After all, all the problems of humankind were laid at the feet of the woman and the snake. Except that, even in the Bible, the snake is not necessarily evil, but is associated with scary power. When Moses and his brother Aaron go before the Pharaoh to demand that he let the Israelites go out of Egypt, Aaron throws down his staff, and it becomes a snake, just as God has promised. In reply, the Pharaoh's sorcerers throw down their staffs, and each one becomes a snake. In a final show of power, Aaron's staff snake swallows up the other staff snakes. Now both sides use snakes as tools of power. In the New Testament, Jesus tells his disciples to go forth and be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Admittedly, there are a lot more negative serpent images than positive ones in the Bible. Take the deadly Leviathan of the sea. The apocalyptic red dragon with seven heads, bearing seven crowns, and throws a third of the heavenly stars to the earth. And the dragon, that old serpent, which is Satan, and the devil, from the book of Revelation. In the rest of the world, serpents have a long history as symbols of fertility, rebirth, as well as spiritual power. The meditating Buddha was shielded by a multi-headed serpent deity, or Naga, named Mukulinda. In Hindu mythology, Vishnu was said to sleep peacefully, while floating on the cosmic waters, supported by the serpent Shisha. In the Homi mythology, West Africa, the serpent that supports everything is called Dan. In Votum of Benin, in Haiti, Aida Wedo, the rainbow serpent, is a symbol of fertility, rainbows, and snakes, and the wife of Dan, the father of spirits. In Mesoamerican and Northern American Indian groups, snakes often served as spiritual guides, or others, during shamanic trances enabling the shaman to cross over into the spirit realm in order to restore balance between the two worlds. 
and of pre-Christian Europeans were animists, believers in spirits that resided in natural elements, such as trees, rivers, the sky, and various animals. Snakes and birds were especially important because they were capable of crossing between the worlds. The snake could go above the ground or go to the underworld. The bird could be on the earth or part of the sky. As such, they had special powers. Because they can shed their skins, snakes were associated with the cycle of life and death. A very old Celtic snake goddess named Corchin was connected with the energy of the earth and rebirth. The Ouroboros, the snake biting its tail, was a symbol of eternity. The Celtic god named Carnonos was usually portrayed as a man with stag antlers because he could shapeshift into a stag. Typically, his legs were snakes, sometimes horned snakes. Serpent devotion was common in Britain and in the continent. The druid symbol was the snake. When Christianity arrived in the British Isles, the Catholic Church felt it was important to transfer religious power from the Druids to the new religion. St. Patrick is said to have driven the snakes out of Ireland, but actually there weren't any snakes in Ireland, not after the last ice age. And the driving out was symbolic, one of many such efforts. St. George impaled the dragon on his righteous spear. St. Margaret stabbed the dragon with a cross, but the dragon refused to be conquered. Long a favorite of the Celts, Anglo-Saxons, and Norsemen, the dragon continued, even after the advent of Christianity, to be the emblem of the chief. And at this point, when the eagle and the serpent are perfectly paired opposites, they represent not victory or defeat, but a dynamic cosmic completion, the union of spirit and matter. This is the same combination as the American Indian winged rattlesnakes, the Mesoamerican feathered serpent, the Egyptian winged snake goddess, and the paired winged serpent tail creator beings in Chinese myth. This is the force that drives the universe of the celestial bird and the serpent wheel forever, in perfect balance of opposite energies around the portal of heaven. The serpent actually represents Enki, the good guy god of the Samaritan epics. It represents knowledge, although it can be misused in evil ways, it is not evil. The serpent came to stand for darkness and evil. This is a big example of how truth is now misrepresented. Now the eagle was Enlil's symbol because Enlil had commanded the skies and he was considered the bad god. We're taught that the eagle is good here in the U.S., representing freedom, but not so fast. The eagle actually represents domination and control. The eagle was Enlil's symbol, a dark god, if ever there was one seen as Zeus among other identities. Inki, the serpent or dragon, was god of the seas, of the land, and also seen as Poseidon among other identities. It was Enlil's choice to destroy mankind with a flood that made Noah famous. It was Enki who went to warn Noah. I am told it was also Enki and his half-sister, Ninma, who have programmed the current awakening into humanity's DNA. Thanks. The gods the fallen angels, the giant Anunnaki, or whatever you want to call them, were master geneticists. Could it be that the whole serpent in the Garden of Eden story is misrepresenting truth, too? Never mind that humanity is not native to this earth, that it is populated by ETs from elsewhere. Remember, the Anunnaki were highly advanced geneticists who arrived after the others had already settled here. They did not create us, they altered us. Don't forget, we've been horribly dumbed down. Earth's whole human race. How might that have happened? Huh. Could genetic manipulation have played a role? They say in their creation story it did. But one god liked the humans. And one did not. An ancient nuclear event destroyed the Sumerian civilization because of the power struggles of Enki and Enlil that led up to it. Using genetic engineering... They created modern humanity to do their work and installed themselves as our kings, their gods. Enki had a friendly relationship with the first two humans. Then Enlil, Enki's brother, took over as commander of Earth, installing a soul god theocracy and a war against the clan of Enki and humanity for spoiling the bloodlines through interbreeding. This shift imposed a blackout 
not only of the very human nature of Anunnaki gods, but also the humanity's own ancient past on Earth. Two of Enlil's attacks against the Yankee clan and humanity are described in the stories of the Deluge and the Tower of Babel. His final attempt after coercing the assembly of the gods into voting yes was the nuclear bombing of five cities in the Jordan Plain, including Sodom and Gomorrah, which resulted in the destruction of Sumerian civilization. However, after each attempt, humanity was saved by Enki, chief scientist Ninma, and Enki's son, Hermes. The unraveling of some dark events in our past through the detailed accounts of the Sumerian tablets could make your hair stand up especially when we discover the true and dire reasons for the smashing of the Babel Tower, and especially the erasing of Sodom and Gomorrah by weapons of mass destruction. Enlil's temple, one was named House of the Mountain, among the titles accorded to him are the King of Lands, King of Heaven and Earth, and Father of the Gods. Enlil was also known as the God of Weather, and according to the Sumerians, Enlil helped create the humans but then got tired of their noise and tried to kill him off by sending a flood. The mortal named Unipistum survived the flood through the help of another god, Enki. Enki was known as the god of the sweet waters, crafts, and wisdom. Enki's watery power never dies and is a living, joyous force. Enki is the god of ritual illustration and purification from polluting evil. Enki was peaceful and loving, never overreacting. The arts of civilization, the institutions and crafts as well as economies, are Enki's gift to humanity. He aligns with humanity, outwitting Enlil in the flood myth. Enki first refuses to send a flood to exterminate the humans and advises to build a boat and thus save the living from utter destruction. Enki is a mediator whose compassion and sense of humor breaks the wrath of Enlil. Enki teaches us to see the qualities in men and nature so that we can better judge our deeds and our fates. Look, this all comes down to a battle between intelligent humans versus enslaved humanity. This reveals how humanity's long history and conflict was shaped between the battle between Enki and his brother Enlil. And it has been Enlil's humans versus Enki's humans. <laughs> This war between the brothers Enki and Enlil reveals how the concept of sin and the inferiority of women were born out of Enlil's attempts to enslave and then wipe out humanity repeatedly overcome by Enki. Our problems and struggles have been shaped by two enemy gods fighting and implicating humanity in the wake of their own competition for power. The conflict between good and evil or the eagle and the serpent is one of the most common conventional themes in literature and is sometimes considered to be the universal part of the human condition. And the war between the immortal gods continues to this day. Have you picked a side yet? In the Sumerian text, there are some stories of Enki and Enlil. There are portions devoted to both. Enlil seemingly reigned supreme in this age. Abraham and his descendants served Enlil, and followed his laws. The Egyptians, on the other hand, were Enki's protégés, and were based on food management practices during those devastating droughts. All of this was around the time of Jacob and Joseph. They were doing a lot better than Enlil's followers. Obviously, Noah backed the right horse. Enki shared boat plans with him. Enlil later claimed Noah as his own. And at a point, circa 2000 BCE, all hell broke loose between the two. In an all-out war of Enki's humans fought against Enlil's humans. The battle for Earth and your soul. Enki versus Enlil. Eagle versus Serpent started. Sodom and Gomorrah took the brunt of the action and were destroyed by a weapon of mass destruction. The radioactive fallout resulted in the final destruction of the Sumerian civilization. After this action, the idea of unilateral actions was a bit more constrained. Enlil was no longer the undisputed lord of the command among his peers, which might be just as well. This muddled and unparalleled concept of Enlil being right when he was wrong, honest when he was dishonest, was born out of an inerrant fear of his vengeful power 
in unbounded wrath. Sound like somebody else we know? Whether as Yahweh in Genesis or as Enlil in the Mesopotamian record, it was he who had instigated the Semitic invasions, which led to the confusion of tongues and the fall of summer, not to mention the shortening of lives. He made his brother change the speech of the one voice Sumerians. It was he who had brought about the devastating flood, and it was he who had leveled the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, not because of their wickedness, as we've been told, but because of the wisdom and insight of their inhabitants. It was Yahweh who removed the Israelites from their homeland, sending them into seventy years of captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar II and his five Babylonian successors. During this time, Enlil never raised a hand to assist them. In Enlil's view, they were quite expendable. First, when we are talking about the fight between good and evil, we are, in effect, speaking about our Heavenly Father and the God of this world. The Bible teaches that the God of this world is a lying murderer and the father of all liars and murderers. John 8.44 says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him, when he speaketh lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar, and the father of it. Now picture good on one side of the battlefield, and evil on the other. All of the evil that we see in society today come from man being deceived by God of this world. For him to accomplish his goals in this world, he needs mankind to serve and worship him loyally. In a world where everything is upside down and backwards, you have to ask yourself if these Anunnaki are not still controlling this planet today. In a world where everything is upside down and backwards, I'd rather choose to question everything instead of being blindly led to the slaughterhouse by the controllers who put us in this position in the first place. Our planet has only been in total peace for about 8% of our recorded history. Now this point alone raises many questions. Why are we in perpetual wars with one another when ultimately our souls desire love and peace? Look at all the deaths incurred through the Spanish Inquisition and the Crusades. Why do all religions need to kill for peace? Why were heretics burned at the stake when the Bible says to love thy neighbor and your enemy? Why did indigenous people sacrifice their own people to the gods? What loving God would want us to kill for him? And virtually everyone is tired of being in perpetual wars and would crave peace. Yet those who are being sent to war never question the authorities who send them there. This would fall in line as being in the same difference of being a heretic in the days of witch burning. Who is at the top of the pyramid watching us so intently? While there are many interpretations of who this is, it is possible that the person at the top of this pyramid isn't even from this planet and relies on us killing one another to survive on sacrificial energies. Many people blindly believe that their country's respective leaders hold the ultimate power, but they fail to realize that these leaders are answering to higher powers. Many people are oblivious to what is happening before their very own eyes, but soon it will become blatantly apparent as the veil lifts and more people awaken every day. It's obvious that who's ever in control of this planet is using us for slavery and for sacrificial reasons through perpetual wars with one another, just being mean to each other. The one thing they fear most is the bottom of the pyramid uniting, because in numbers we have power, and without us they don't exist. They won't exist. One last point that I feel we must add here. Yahweh is an amalgamation of gods as presented in the Bible's Old Testament. However, Yahweh, in reality, is Enlil, with the attributes of Enki later written in by the tribe of Judah. To suggest Yahweh in the Bible is other than Enlil is equivalent to allowing yourself to continue being a victim of the great deception. In short, a great oddity about humanity is our moral range, from unspeakable viciousness to heartbreaking generosity. Ain't that the truth?